my name is uh, Guo Bin Yang. Um, I'm a faculty at the uh, Weatherhead East Asian Institute um, of Columbia University. Welcome to the uh, Global Center um, East Asia um, of Columbia University. Um, I'm very pleased to have with us four speakers on the theme of the environment and urbanization in China. Uh, I'd like to say a couple of words about whether at the Asian Institute because uh, this uh, is one of a series of uh, uh, panels, public events hosted, organized by the uh, Weatherhead East Asian Institute last week. There was another one right here on American democracy. Uh, so, and there are others uh, in other places, but uh, it's been a regular feature of the Institute. But this year, this event coincides with another program uh, of of the university, and the, the, the program is uh, called Global Scholars Program. It's a new initiative of the university uh, for undergraduate education with a special emphasis on global education. And the theme of that program for this summer is also environment and urbanization in China. So uh, the students in that program are also in this room and, uh, but uh, I am especially pleased to welcome um, others, old friends, as well as new friends. And I hope that you will be able to uh, continue to support our program, the Weather at East Asian Institute and the Global Center. And the events here, that's better, that's better. But, well, the important part comes uh, comes after the initial introduction. Um, I'd like to uh, introduce our speakers um, all together, I mean, uh, uh, four of them together, and then I'll turn the uh, uh, not, uh, turn uh, this uh, over to Don. I think we're going to follow the uh, order of the program. Um, the first speaker will be uh, Jennifer Holloway. Second is Li Bo. And third, uh, Shi Zhengzhi, and last one is Wang Yongchen. Uh, Jennifer Holloway is a program director and China representative at the Social Science Research Council in the city of New York. And uh, here is Jennifer. She is currently based at the Institute of Geographic Sciences and Natural Resources Research Institute, uh, where she has the SSRC's China Environment and Health Initiative. She's also co-director of the Forum on Health, Environment, and Development, CEHI and FORHEP, uh, the initial for those two programs, work with researchers, policymakers, and NGOs to build interdisciplinary knowledge and networks for addressing the environmental health impacts of development in China. She recently edited a special issue for the Journal of Contemporary China on environment and health in China. Li Bo is a member of the board of directors and program advisor to Friends of Nature. He serves as a steering committee member of the China Biodiversity Task, Task Force for IUC and China and Committee on Environment, Economic and Social Policy. He was the executive director of Friends of Nature from January 2009 to April 2012. From 2008 to 2010, he was a research fellow in the India-China Institute, the new school in New York. He was a research associate on sustainable livelihoods, China's ecological footprint in the Mekong 2050 scenario study, and the coordinator of capacity building component of the sustainable uh, network in Stockholm Environment Research Institute's Asia's office in Bangkok. From 2002 to 2006, he was based in Kunming and Shangri-La, implementing and researching on community-based natural resources management projects and small grant making on environmental justice and legal aid. Legal aid projects working with the Center for Biodiversity and Indigenous Knowledge, Southwest China. From 1994 to 1998, he was a project officer on environment and poverty reduction with Oxfam Hong Kong. He consulted for MacArthur Foundation program for assessment of large land scale conservation in Southwest China. 
They both graduated from Yunnan Nationality Institute with a bachelor's degree of arts and Cornell University with a master's of sciences in national resource management. Shi Zhengzhi is a professor of journalism and communication at Peking University. The areas of teaching include and research include mass media and social change, contemporary publishing issues, public relations, civil society, and new media. He has done extensive research on public communication, new media, and civil society, culture and identities, and um, new media empowerment. Uh, she has published ex extensively on these areas, and I personally actually have uh, benefited a lot from reading Professor Schur's works. Our final um, speaker will be uh, Wang Yongchen, who is uh, probably very well known to, to, uh, to all of us here. She's a senior reporter of China National Radio and a key founder and convener of Green Earth Volunteers, uh, which is one of the leading environmental NGOs in China, if I remember correctly, was founded to start the project in, in 1996. Um, I have a very long introduction, so I'm going to be a little brief um, about, uh, I think I'd like to read the uh, mention a few recent uh, highlights, right? Um, um, Wang Chen uh, has uh, led uh, many important projects and environmental cam campaigns and published extensively on um, a lot of the issues, um, both in Chinese and in English. I just saw her uh, new English book. Can you show us the new English uh, book uh, titled um, if the glaciers on the roof of the world were to vanish, which is uh, in English, but a series of other books on various uh, environmental issues. And I think um, is, uh, without further, uh, instead of me going over all the books, uh, we will have some time to, uh, to talk with her after our panel and to uh, take a look at her books, which she, she has there. So without further ado, I think I'm going to turn this over to um, Jennifer. Which really demands interdisciplinary collaboration. 
in order to understand the problems, you need environmental science and medical research. But in order to address the drivers of those problems, you have to have social science research. Um, environmental research by itself is not going to tell you what kinds of policy um, change you might need or what kinds of uh, different responses from, from society. So we thought this was an area in which we could make a contribution. Um, and our initial mapping process of the field uh, did in fact find that there was very little communication between uh, researchers in different disciplines and that not much of the research was very readily available to users, um, even though there was quite a big demand. So since 2007, we've been trying through a various different uh, range of activities to try and stimulate um, research and stimulate uh, more communication between professionals working in this field. We have a small grant program. Um, we run a, uh, an annual summer workshop and an annual conference. And if anybody wants uh, some information, you can uh, take some of the propaganda. Um, we work mostly now through a local platform, which is called the Forum on Health, Environment and Development, which is based at the CAS Geography Institute. Um, but we now have over 400 people who are involved in some level in our activities, and they include uh, researchers from many disciplines, uh, journalists, and a lot of NGO uh, representatives um, involved in different things. So, um, to relate what we do a little bit more directly, often I talk about policy, um, changes in policy uh, regarding environment in China. But today I think it's more useful to talk a little bit about civil society and to think perhaps in two directions. First of all, uh, what is research? Research about civil society and environment and health in China. What do we know about what uh, NGOs, the media, and citizens are doing about these issues? And secondly, research for civil society in China. Uh, to what extent is the research that's being generated useful um, to anybody, and how might we make it more useful and promote better, uh, more productive uh, interactions between um, civil society organizations and uh, researchers? I have a tendency to speak too quickly, so if anybody has uh, a problem, uh, please um, alert me to that. Especially in English, that's why it's better to make me speak Chinese than I have to slow down. So, in thinking about environment and health, I think one of the things that's really struck me, because I've worked on a lot of other policy fields uh, in my life, I'm a political scientist by training, is that this policy field has some very specific uh, characteristics. It's a very particular issue domain. And I think when you're uh, thinking about how to grapple with it, we really need to bear that in mind. Not only um, China's particular circumstances, but also the, the issues which relate to this particular policy area. Um, there's a lot of work uh, about, which um, yeah, Bobbin has contributed to, about uh, the idea of uh, uh, political opportunity structures. So where are the opportunities for policy innovation or for society to social movements and so on? Um, but most of that research tends to focus on regime characteristics. It tends to focus on institutional arrangements and policy legacies tends to be less concerned with the way in which the, the nature of the problem shapes the kinds of opportunities for different sorts of people to generate knowledge, for different sorts of people to have input into that process. And I think um, uh, if, if you don't consider that, um, it's, it hampers your ability to find uh, good solutions to, to problems. That the, the capacity of different people to generate knowledge and share knowledge and feed knowledge into policy processes is, is quite crucial. So, so, so what is it about environment and health, the interaction between environment and health that makes it special, that makes it difficult? Um, and does it even need to be thought about as a particular discrete area of policy and NGO work? I mean, that might be the first question, right? Is it new? Like, why is it new? Why is it not enough just to do more environment, and more environment and protection and provide better health care, better access to health care? In many for many policy issues, basically what you're trying to do is to get the government either to spend more money on doing more of the same thing, or to uh, expand coverage right, to particular populations who may be vulnerable or who may have been excluded or whatever. Um, and I would argue that that's not true for environment and health. It's not a question of doing more of the same. It requires quite fundamental shifts in policy. Um, and not fundamental shifts only within environment and health, but also within some other policy sectors. Um, and this, this is because what you're dealing with is trying to uh, identify and manage um, the impact
impact largely from our point of view of pollution on health, right? Um, and if you look at what environmental protection uh, policy has been um, until very recently, you'll see that what it's mostly been about has been reducing aggregate pollution, um, with very little consideration of whether those pollutants are specifically damaging to population health. And to a certain extent, there's been progress in reducing aggregate pollution of many kinds, or at least the increase has been brought under control. But if you think about the, pollution, the pollutants which are specifically damaging to health, they will not necessarily be reduced sufficiently by an aggregate control policy. You have to focus on what are called terjung hu specific pollutants, right? Um, you have to target those. So environmental policy has to shift towards thinking about um, specific pollutions and also thinking about human exposure. Um, which is also not inevitably dealt with just through an aggregate pollution emissions uh, reduction program. Right? You have to think about where you have populations of people, and particularly vulnerable populations of people, living close to pollution sources, or living in ways which make them more vulnerable to those pollution sources. So it needs change, specific policies with the environmental sphere, and also in health. Um, it's not enough just to expand healthcare in a general way. You need uh, health monitoring, health surveillance, disease surveillance, which is focused on uh, populations who are vulnerable to various kinds of uh, pollutants. Um, and you need health care, which may be targeted to helping people get treatment for particular diseases in particular places, at particular points in time, where that exposure is particularly damaging. And so far, um, health policy in, in China is not doing that. Health policy in China has been quite effective in dealing with a lot of traditional uh, environmental health problems, uh, sanitation kinds of problems. And now it's already working quite hard on some of the lifestyle uh, diseases, um, uh, chronic fatigue. Um, but what it hasn't done so far is to focus on um, incidents of illnesses which are related to pollution. And you see that very clearly when you see the reaction of local CDCs to outbreaks of lead poisoning among children. They're completely unprepared. They don't, have the, uh, they don't have the testing equipment, they don't know what to say to families, they're completely uh, taken by surprise by, by all of this. So there really is a need for, for new policy. Um, and I think uh, this is something which is not sufficiently recognized. Um, sometimes those uh, specific needs get sort of folded into arguments about uh, you know, there's a system problem, right? Um, but all system problems are not the same. There are system problems which are common to all policy areas, and there are system problems which are very specific. Um, and if you don't recognize what you're dealing with, then your solution is not going to be very uh, effective. So that was one point that I wanted to, uh, to make. Um, this need for sort of more debate, domain specific uh, approach. So basically, the particular challenges of this policy field, the one that it cuts across a lot of different policy sectors. You need to think about environment, you need to think about health, you need to think about often about transportation, land use, uh, the siting of industries, um, all of these need to be there. Um, the other very important thing is that it involves a very high degree of complexity and uncertainty. It's very difficult uh, to prove cause-effect relationships um, when you're dealing with environmental and it's particularly difficult to prove those relationships when both the industries and the people are moving all the time. Which in China, of course, we know that they are. You have industry now moving away from the uh, developed eastern coast into the hinterland, and you have migrants moving from the hinterland into the, you know, into the uh, more developed areas. So it's very hard to say exactly what caused this particular individual to be sick at any given time. Too many people are, involved, are exposed to too many things different places at different times, um, it's, it's very, very difficult to do. And this makes it hard to develop an evidence-based policy, um, and it also makes it very difficult, and this is relevant for uh, civil society, it makes it very difficult for people who are not trained to uh, engage in policy debates, because it's, it's, there, are so many, uh, there are so many complexities. And this, I think it's very important to, to note, is true everywhere in the world, it's not just true in China. It's if you read the OECD literature on um, dealing with environment and health uh, interactions um, in Europe, it's the same story. Um, so uh, that also needs to be, to be factored in. And it makes it especially difficult for um, civil society organizations to, to get involved. It's much easier if you're talking about reducing aggregate pollution or you're talking about protecting a certain area. Um, 
um, that's that's a, a much more uh, straightforward kind of work. The other, the, the third problem, and I think at this point we, we kind of shift from uh, thinking about issue-specific challenges to China-specific challenges. Um, and to a certain extent, we all know everything is always more complicated in China, right? Um, it's big, it's diverse, it's changing very rapidly. Um, and if you apply those you know, three, um, you know, the three uh, China characteristics to this particular area, you see then that you have incredible uh, regional variety in terms of the province, which are very specific depending on the kinds of industry you have in certain places, um, which will be very different depending on the natural resources and the human resources. Um, they're very different in terms of different regional abilities to uh, manage those problems because development is so uneven. So environmental agencies uh, have very different capacity. Uh, health uh, agencies have very different capacity in different areas. Um, and also because people and, and industries are moving, as I said before. So you see in China really a situation in which in some ways it looks uh, within the country very much like the set of relationships that you have between uh, the early industrializing countries and the later industrializing countries, where now the East Coast and the early industrialized parts of China, to a certain extent, uh, many of their environmental health problems are getting better. Um, at least the ones associated with uh, manufacturing um, and energy production are getting better because those industries are moving out. Um, they're moving out to the west and to the center. Um, and so the problems which they face now are much more uh, related to air pollution um, and to trash disposal. They're, they're kind of rich country uh, problems which they face now. But the poorer parts of China now are starting to see the uh, industrial pollution and other problems being transferred to them. So it's a little bit like you know what happened between the U.S. and Europe and, uh, and China and India, except that it's taking place within the China context. So all of this uh, has quite a strong effect on, on what it's possible for civil society to do, um, and I think uh, makes it very clear that our expectations could not be too high too quickly. This is an immensely difficult set of problems to get to grips with. Um, there hasn't been an awful lot of uh, research on the topic. Yan Bobin um, is one of the few people who's worked on it. He um, wrote an article for the special issue um, in 2010 in which he looked at what um, journalists and media were doing in this area. And he found um, very much a separation between urban and rural concerns. Um, and generally, that both journalists and NGOs were working more on issues of interest to urban populations, um, including um, waste disposal and air pollution, and uh, to a certain extent, sort of more general issues like climate change, than they were on um, issues of concern to rural populations, like industrial pollution, water quality, and, and so on. Um, also, not surprisingly really, that issues which were less sensitive politically um, got more attention um, than those in which you would get into some sort of conflictual relationship uh, with a particular government actor. And he attributed this to largely, uh, partly to the location of most NGOs and media organizations in cities, um, but also to their natural identification with people like them, um, who tend to be mostly uh, uh, urban populations. And there hasn't been, I'd be interested to hear what, what, what you think. It seems to me, uh, although there hasn't been any new content analysis, as if um, this is probably still generally true, um, that there's been a lot more media attention lately to um, solid waste and air pollution. Those have really kind of ratcheted up in terms of their, their coverage. Um, and that the rural issues are still uh, less present, with the exception of heavy metal pollution, um, and particularly the way that heavy metal pollution, and to a certain extent agricultural pollution through pesticides, um, how they feed into food safety. Um, I think it's really through food safety that the rural issues become more prominent. Um, because basically, the production of food transfers risk. The production and sale of food transfers risk from rural areas to urban areas. Um, and so it generates an interest in the part of urban populations in what's going on in the countryside, which they would not necessarily have um, otherwise. So there's a kind of flow of risk, or some people call it a democratization of risk, um, um, which I think you can see. Um, so I'm going to 
In the first, has done a little bit of work lately on environmental NGOs and industrial pollution, and also found that very few um, were working in this area, and that um, in general, um, only a very limited number at the national level, including um, uh, the Institute for Public and Environmental Affairs, Friends of Nature, and the Centre for Legal Assistance to Pollution uh, Victims, who have really uh, engaged with policy and analysing policy and working on policy. Um, and some of the others at the local level were doing some work on um, trying to monitor pollution, trying to provide uh, medical assistance to pollution victims, um, but that they weren't really able to, in a position to, to, uh, to go beyond that. Um, which I think is not, not surprising, um, given, given the situation. Um, she's also done some uh, analysis of her conversations with, she visited the 40 environmental NGOs who were working on these issues, and, and she did some analysis of uh, what she found to be, they perceived to be their barriers. Um, and many of them did mention um, that they really lacked the scientific training to uh, to judge you know, which pollution sources were most damaging to health. They wanted to, but it was very difficult for them to figure it out, especially when those pollution sources are invisible. Um, and unfortunately, some of the most damaging uh, uh, chemicals are invisible. Lead is invisible, you can't see it. Um, and so there's a, there's a general tendency for, if you're not very informed, just to assume that the dirtier uh, water source is actually the most damaging, which is not necessarily true. Um, the other, other problems were that people who did have uh, scientific training, relevant scientific training, had too many other job opportunities. They're not very likely to stay in rural areas and work on these issues. Um, but another one which relates to the cross-cutting uh, nature of the field is that most of the um, ENGOs, their, their connections, their networks, and their knowledge networks were very limited to environmental, the environmental system. They weren't connected up to the health people. Um, and the health NGOs on the other side, only one that I know of is working on, uh, on pollution impacts on health, the uh, YHDRA in Yunnan. And even they don't really do all that much uh, on, on this issue. So there's, there's a kind of a disconnect between um, the concern on the one hand, the very strong concern that a lot of the NGOs have with health. I mean, many of them are formed because of the health impacts and their actual capacity to work on those issues. And most of the uh, capacity building, which is available, um, sponsored either by international foundations or now partly by um, uh, domestic foundations, most of it is, is not issue specific. Most of it is much more general in terms of building it, uh, NGO capacity to do certain kinds of things and manage themselves better. But it doesn't provide the kind of in-depth uh, um, training that we needed to work effectively on, on this um, Do I have any more time? Or am I, uh, two minutes? One, minute, one more thing. Because I didn't say anything about the, 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 just to say one thing on the other side about the research and the way the research does or doesn't, um, uh, doesn't help. Um, there's been quite a lot of social science research on, on these issues um, in the last uh, couple of years, mostly. Um, but I think one of the big problems with it is, and you can see there's some in here and um, I can interest, I can recommend some other things. We know quite a lot now about the way in which people are responding to some of these problems. Um, but I think one of the difficulties is that a lot of it is very, still very disconnected from the natural science research. So you'll have an article about this population here, that population there. But the sites are not chosen um, in order to uh, inform us about typical problems. They're not chosen in ways which are connected up to development processes in China. <coughs> they tend to be very random. The way in which social scientists work is very random. Um, in terms of selection of problems. Um, and uh, most of it still happens within particular policy streams. It's either about environmental policy or it's about health policy. It doesn't look about a, a connection. And lastly, and this is my last point, and then I'm going to be quiet. Um, lastly, um, it, does, it lacks a kind of comparative lens. So a lot of the, uh, a lot of the, the, uh, the analysis tends to be framed in terms of a, a critique of, of problems with the Chinese system. Um, but if you put China in comparison to, say, India, or China in comparison to the US or Europe, you'll, you'll come to very different conclusions about what exactly it is about the workings of the Chinese system and the way in which civil society and the state interact about environment and health um, will look very, very different. And if you just stay within this sort of China studies focus, I think you miss um, a great deal. So um, I'll stop there. <laughs> Sorry to take so long.
Um, thank you very much for inviting me to share uh, from the last three years uh, of my experience working at Friends of Nature. Um, I think the three years have really given me a good opportunity to connect issues of urban with the issues I used to know a lot. I think I used to know a lot about the rural. Uh, <clears throat> today's title is uh, Urbanization and Environment. Um, I used to be based in Yunnan province, and that's where everything is about environment and the rural development. <clears throat> What I see is, uh, as a result of the, the, the economic reform, there are so many new investors coming into this region and trying to cash in the natural resources, no matter in form of dam building or mining or mass tourism development projects. Most of the opportunities people are <coughs> taking advantage of local people who have little access to information and access to market. So oftentimes the contracts are signed at a very bad deal and put a huge disadvantage to the local populations. By the time they find out, it's already too late. The environment are damaged and they have to live up with all the environmental impact or the social impact. And then I moved into cities in the capital of China. I start to understand that despite the fact that there are so many conservation projects that have been devised by international NGOs or government initiative, for instance, government after 1998 has issued this policy of logging ban that you know, government has uh, invested very heavily in the name of um, ecological financial transfer or the payment for ecosystem services for the uh, reforestation of our planned river uh, systems. Um, but really, what it does is to ask those people who are oftentimes uh, denied of a lot of development opportunities to try to make magic work. For instance, you know, they are already um, concerning the nature, their culture are already, you know, helping uh, nature conservation. They have to do more. Uh, but in fact, resources are explored and sent into cities. I have a few pictures I want to show you, but this is the, the, the study of the slide I thought really well captures today's China in terms of the environment and urbanization. If you know, this is uh, uh, sort of following the style of China's traditional painting, mountains and rivers, but if you look carefully, what is behind, what is being created is using the construction sites, uh, uh, typical construction site. They use those canvas to cover the dirt. And so the artists, they use this, this kind of uh, scenery to recreate the Chinese landscape. And this is exactly what is happening to the Chinese environment. It is mountains and it's rivers, but, in, but everything is under construction. So, what we are talking about, development, environment, urbanization, we are, China is recreating a new landscape, but whether this landscape is sustainable or not, you see a lot of um, new construct and the different people have different interpretations. This picture shows the comparison between 1920s when Joseph Rock, an American who came to this region of the world to study the 
the, the landscape and the plants. The picture at the bottom, you see, this is the, the town of Lijiang, and there is hardly any houses. And if you look at the picture above, that's in 1980s. So in a matter of 80 or 19 years, the landscape has changed dramatically, and this is called urbanization. <coughs> That's the village I used to work. People still practice sacred landscape. A lot of alpine land. Uh, lakes are still protected as everyday religion of the local people. And people still believe in you know, sacred land that's called uh, the Zhida. That's a small mountain hill people don't allow any harvesting in those forests because they believe that this is there where spirit lives. But if you look at what is happening, I'm sure um, uh, my friend uh, Wang Wuxiang is going to speak a lot about the, the hydro development. And look at this river in southwest China. How many dams have been built and the cost of extinction of freshwater dolphin? In fact, there are so many. <coughs> <coughs> so many more dams are added, and we are together fighting a recent a dam project, which is called Xiaonanhai. If you are interested in knowing more, we can tell you more later. And uh, not only dams, the modern consumption, the urban consumption, takes all sorts of form. This is the site, this is an airplane wetland, just next to the village I used to work, Chen Kai Ge, the director. Who, took, who made a film here and basically trashed this place. So urbanization in China, no matter recreational use or energy production or ecotourism or mining, every form, you name it, it ventures into pristine ecosystem. So, you know, urbanization, what we are talking about, we are talking about uh, landfill and incineration being the primary drive to waste management. We're talking about disappearing wilderness and urbanization is becoming a concrete forest. We're talking about shortage of water, pollution of water. We're talking about traffic jam, decreased mobility. And uh, the, the, the irony is people, when they get richer, they purchase vehicles, and vehicles are supposed to be faster than walking, but in fact, it is not. And this is urbanization. And we are talking about there is little information disclosure or accountability or public financing. Public financing in public health issues or public transportation issues or anything that going on in the cities. We're talking about public services, also lack of information disclosure. People are served, but they have little say about how service should be provided and how efficient. And uh, urbanization also means that Earth City is driving the people. People are becoming the slave of the city, a slave of the urban development. And we're talking about high carbon development. In, 19, in, 19, in 2009, China, almost at the same scale of the US, has launched a massive uh, development, huge development. And in recent, I think this year, China is launching another huge investment, hoping to heat up the econ economy. The, but, a lot of environment scrutiny mechanisms are loosened up because they want the money to quickly pump in to the development. And this is what we see in today's world. Buildings are short-lived, and building, in fact, creates huge trash. And that, that's, you know, what building comes from. It comes from metal, it comes from concrete, and all of those things energy and emits carbon dioxide. So urban are development so fast. But you know, if you look towards the West, there is a different world. So what can we learn from Western part of China? Philosophically, culturally, what can we learn? 
And I like to put those questions there. Resources are coming from upland to lowland. Pollutions are coming from lowland to upland. In today's world, China likes to talk about uh, green civilization, ecological civilization. Where do those come from? And can we learn from the rural areas? And uh, environmental protection for whom? And whose issue is that? And who, and it, it is in the name of salva salvation of, it, it is in whose salvation that we protect the environment? Um, this is an, in a department store very close to where I live, uh, in the north of the fifth ring. This is a billboard within a department store. I ask a lot of uh, 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 the service people in the shop, are they hot standing? Because they have a lot of shops beside this billboard. And they said it's really hot. And they have to use air conditioning to cool it down indoor. You know, urban development these days are really crazy. We use this kind of billboard to advertise what to people what they should buy, but at the same time we use air conditioning to, keep, to cool it down. And at the same time we ask for more energy, more dams to be built. You know, after the Olympic game, we like to believe that, you know, the, the bird nest and the swimming pool are in this kind of environment, but if you visit bird nest, it is not like this at all. We, we imagine the, the ecological civilization is friendly, but the reality is not. If you just search Google or search Baidu with sonar, the word of sonar, in Beijing, there are more than 3,000 sonar service spots. I'm sure a lot of small service that are not registered are not there. And Beijing, per capita water consumption, is lower than national average. And China is a water resource poor country. Um, this is the founder of Friends of Nature. <coughs> He says, China is the kitchen of the world. We cook for the world. Let's not even mention whether the world likes what China has made. But, but by the end of the day, we messed up this kitchen. And it is the Chinese that live up with this kitchen. Talking about waste, China now is the number one waste producer at the same time, number one waste importer from especially Japan, North America, and Europe. So China is managing a lot of waste for the whole world. And if you look at this map, the green, the, the red arrow suggests that, you know, China right now is at the lower amount of per capita trash production. But Ideally, China should head the green arrow direction, but in fact, experts are, 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 are estimating that China is heading the, the, the red direction, which is really bad. And the carbon emission of energy sources comparison. This is US data. The incinerator actually emits highest carbon dioxide. But China now is heading to build more incinerators. Cost of energy production. We like to believe that incineration is also a green energy production, and therefore they are getting subsidized. But in fact, if you look at these figures, the cost of energy production by incinerator is so much more higher and a pollutant incinerations has so much more danger and the implication for public health. And I think in urban China, 
many cities, especially in the south, Guangzhou is now very active, expressing um, different opinions against incinerations. And Beijing just had fairly successful campaign to eliminate a project just behind um, Peking University. So you know what we're talking about. We're talking about if we really want to build recycle uh, uh, circular economy, we need to switch from uh, landfill incineration base to to the other side. We need to minimize uh, landfill and incineration. And in fact, U.S. had some bad example, but also had some successful experience in San Francisco area. We need to switch the, the pyramid. And there are a lot of examples in different parts of the world that people are trying to experiment zero waste. Talking about waste in the cities. Pearl River just recently had a major case. The chromium was recharged, was released to the rivers. And the vegetables produced in my province, Yunnan province, is south of Hong Kong. And that's where the chromium was piled up. And this is, look at this map. There are so many huge chromium uh, residues in many parts of China, and mostly along the river courses. And there are huge hazardous threats to the public health. And we spend little resources to understand the causality of those chromium residues and uh, public health. And uh, I'd like to just mention what uh, you know, Jennifer has mentioned. The science, despite the fact that NGO has full capacity to understand the relationship between environment pollution of hazardous waste and public health, but I think the scientific communities in China has done a very limited job. Scientists, they are supposed to say truth or for. But today, a lot of scientists are corrupted. Instead of saying yes or no, or truth or false, they are actually helping the business to say yes or no, whether the project should be go ahead. In fact, we just read the Friends of Nature just had a public interest litigation on the Pearl River pollution cases. And the experts were asked to be in, in a court and they are not saying what they should be saying, whether there, there is a causality. They are saying, oh, we should be more considerate of the government because it's not an easy job. And that's what not scientists should be saying. Scientists should be saying, simply saying, through my test, through my research, I find evidence or I don't find evidence. That's all. But a lot of scientists are not saying that. And the last slide. I like to mention dams. You know, this Shanghai dams above Chongqing is the really the last blow to endangered fish species. And we have scientists. We have asked the scientists to provide evidence, but when there is a contentious, contentious cases, they keep silent. And they don't provide evidences. And I like to differ a little bit. I think NGO in China should push for public participation and accountabilities. And it is scientists' job to actually come up with evidence. Not standing with NGOs or not standing with government or business, they should be standing independently saying what their research has told them. But oftentimes they don't do that. So NGO are forced to take positions based on little evidence or little information that are available to them. Oftentimes when we ask information disclosures from government, it is really difficult and they can reject us by saying this is procedure information, therefore they are, they are not allowed to release it release them. So, in summary, I think environment and uh, 
urbanization is a huge issue in China. China is no longer rural society, but rural urban uh, is, a big, is, is a related issue and it becomes increasingly connected. And uh, my sort of take-home message is this. I have worked in the environmental field for more than 10 years and I learned that there is no technical solution, technical quick fix to environment problems. Without transparency, without accountabilities, technical solution yield no solution. Technical you know, innovations yield no solutions to environment problems. We really need to have widened accountability and transparency so that the public can really get informed and become active monitor of the situation. Thank you. Thank you, Li Bo. Um, our next speaker, Professor Wonder. and the, I think the social media and in, in Western countries 
And maybe they also made a lot of serious programs, uh, for example, uh, private, privacy, privacy issues. But in China, and I think uh, social media, we pay attention to our uh, social changes, and all social changes, and also pay attention to a lot of uh, political issues. And so you can see more and more, you know, China, uh, China gov Chinese government uh, censorship seriously and also uh, control, you know, the new media. But uh, actually, uh, more and more, the new media grow, uh, grows up, grows uh, rapidly. And so what's really happened? And so I, first I think we should ask some, some main questions. And uh, what does the uh, new media really mean in China? And also what roles has been new media playing during the period on Chinese social change? And how many new media have been affecting social change in, in China? And also I think the what relationship are there among the individual and the existing social structures, social relations? Mm -hmm. And so I try to under, uh, answer these questions and I find the, uh, this image of Flanner. Uh, and as you know, from this uh, concept from uh, Walter uh, Benjamin, and uh, in his book, I think he uh, pay attention to individuals. Individuals, and they are very, you, you know, they feel very. This world is uh, passive, is uh, solitary, is uh, people, people and people, it, it, um, among people, a person and just like a uh, atomic. They are, you know, along and uh, strong the uh, arcades and far from the social structures. And they want to, you know, they want to get involved in social structures. They want to be a, to be very important person in 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 the main, you know, social structures. But they can't. But I think this word has a new meaning in in China and uh, particularly on the internet. I think this word I, I use, my, my mean, I, I use, I think they, is, I want to emphasize um, they are, uh, you know, active, interactive, and also the image of the community, communities. And uh, that's, that's uh, what I think. And uh, how to, you know, if you want to, to, to observe uh, Chinese social change. I think we can uh, we can we can observe from five dim uh, five dimension dimensions. And the first, uh, we should pay attention to individuals' uh, attitude and behavior. And uh, I in the, in this uh, meaning, I think I just want to individuals, not just individuals, not just uh, persons. I think they are. Flat, 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 flat. I'm sorry. And uh, I just want to emphasize they are enabled. They can, you know, they can have their uh, self uh, determination, and they they are active. They are not just uh, passive. And that's that's what I think. And also the the two the third I think the the, the second. Uh, uh, dimension and we should pay attention to is the global communication. If the people just a person, just a person, and it's not uh, no meaning, and so people in the society want to be uh, meaningful something, and maybe they should get together, and so gro global communication, uh, particularly dialogue and the debate, uh, can uh, can 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 happen on the internet. And so I, I just want to emphasize uh, internet and also like, you know, it's like a space, it's, it's space and also the time. And uh, it's a very special meaning for me, I think. Uh, time is time, space is time, space is space. But uh, in Chinese new media space, I think, the time just uh, extends to uh, Chinese uh, civilization, C C civilization, uh, <laughs> it's, it's, it's just a lot of meaning and a lot of things. Uh, and also, I, I just want to emphasize on social capital. 
and particularly in China, and the Chinese people, sometimes Chinese people, they don't, uh, they don't, uh, you know, identify uh, private space and the public space. And uh, that's, I think, is a, is a lot of, uh, that's a bad aspect. But also, I, I want to say, also, this exists some, some good aspect, uh, because uh, social capital is, a, is I think, is, a, is a, can, 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 can realize, can, can yeah, it's, it's, it's a very important uh, words can can work in. Can, it, it's possible for people, uh, for indi uh, individuals, to you know contribute to, to establish their community on the internet, and they can help each other, and they can change something. That's what I want to say. And also, I think uh, the the third level, and I think the social change, we should pay attention to organize organizations and then we emphasize on social self-organizations particularly NGOs it's independent NGOs and also we should uh, have a uh, clear uh, boundary um, from you know the state and the, the, the society and also I think very important uh, in Chinese uh, new media and can change our <coughs> Uh, our law and the regulation and the law and the regulation is a, is a, is a very important level for Chinese uh, social change and also the, the, all the things that get together I think it means uh, social change but they, 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 they belong to different levels uh, and uh, the question, another question I think the changes of the individuals identities um, and the first that we call the netizen. Netizen means Wang Yu, Wang Ming. And for all co communication, we just uh, emphasize the uh, one way communication. But more and more, we call the Wang, uh, net friends, Wang Yu. And this means uh, citizens, uh, netizens, just not just get information from the internet, and also they can talk, they can uh, dialogue, and also they can debate. Uh, particularly, a lot of the public affairs, uh, affairs they, they pay attention to to this field, and so it's a different. Uh, and also, I I pay attention to the net criminals. Uh, more and more, you know, uh, e e uh, e e company, uh, just the e, e business business on the internet and the people, you know. They can live. They can live. They can just we call the Chinese China, and they can just stay at home. Everything can get from the internet, and that's very important thing, a symbol. And because a lot of people they don't they can't they can they can read a lot they can know a lot of things without any traditional Chinese media. And you know, uh, as the, in the past, the Chinese new uh, traditional media very play very important role for people to get in, to get in information. To, to, that's very important resources. But now people can ignore, <laughs> and they also can get a lot of information. And so that's the difference. And it's also uh, it's also more and more deal with our everyday life. And so it's also. Uh, offer opportunity and the space for people can uh, can far away from the main uh, social stru structures. And so I, I just want to, yeah, how to see the uh, social and uh, the social change? And I, I also use some you know perspective, perspectives to to observe. And the first I think maybe public space and also the media public space. And uh, uh, media events, a uh, lot of things happen. And uh, this area, I think Professor Yang Bo Bing and I <laughs> pay attention to this field a lot. And uh, more and more, and uh, we, we think, and also the new social movement is also a uh, very important uh, uh, perspective for us to observe Chinese social change. And also e commerce and uh, e government and also e-philosophy. 
and how to <laughs> say that. And also, a lot of people think uh, think uh, pe uh, the officer, uh, senior officer, they don't use the internet. Actually, it's wrong. A lot of Chinese uh, senior officers they, they they pay attention to the new media, and also they get a lot of information from the uh, new media. Differ a little bit. I think NGO in China should push for public participation and accountabilities. And it is scientists' job to actually come up with evidence. Not standing with NGOs or not standing with governmental business, they should be standing independently saying what their research has told them. But oftentimes they don't do that. So NGOs are forced to take positions based on little evidence or little information that are available to them. Oftentimes when we ask information disclosures from government, it is really difficult and they can reject us by saying this is procedure information, therefore they are, they are not allowed to release, it, release them. So in summary, I think environment and the uh, Urbanization is a huge issue in China. China is no longer a rural society, but rural urban uh, is, a bit, is, is a related issue and it becomes increasingly connected. And uh, my sort of take home message is this. I have worked in the environmental field for more than 10 years and I learned that there is no technical solution, technical quick fix to environment problems. Without transparency, without accountabilities, technical solution yield no solution. Technical you know, innovations yield no solutions to environment problems. We really need to have widened accountability and transparency so that the public can really get informed and become active monitor of the situation. Thank you. Thank you, Li Po. Um, our next speaker, Professor Shunder. Can take action 
And that's the three key uh, words I, I focused on. Just the inform people get information, and the people can express, people can uh, take action, use the internet, and use the new media, what really happened in China. That's my uh, first, I think, about uh, these three uh, key words. And then I conclude that I think maybe it's a very important uh, uh, term, uh, new media empowerment in China. And also I find what the new media empowerment, what the, the subject, what the really important element, what is, and I found the words, <laughs> planner. Uh, so I just want to begin my uh, lecture. And uh, as you know, uh, social media, actually internet, uh, began in uh, internet, uh, more and more people use internet, I think, is, uh, for almost uh, 20 years. Uh, but uh, social media play a very important role in China, and uh, we must uh, mention the uh, Weibo in China. And the Weibo, as you know, is just like uh, uh, Twitter. But it's different. Twitter and uh, I think the social media and in in West countries and maybe they also made a lot of serious programs, uh, for example, uh, private privacy privacy issues. But in China and I think uh, social media, we pay attention to our social change and all social changes and also pay attention to a lot of uh, political issues. And so you can see more and more, you know, China, uh, China gov Chinese government uh, censorship seriously and also uh, control, you know, the new media. But uh, actually, uh, more and more new media grow, uh, grows up, grows uh, rapidly. And so what's really happened? And so I, first I think we should ask some, some main questions. And uh, what does the uh, new media really mean in China? And also, what roles has been new media playing during the period on Chinese social change? And how many new media have been affecting social change in, in China? And also, I think, the, what relationship are there among the individual and existing social structures, social relations? And so I try to under, uh, answer these questions and I find the uh, this image of uh, Flanders. And as you know, Flanders is a concept from uh, Walter uh, Benjamin. And uh, in his book, I think he uh, pay attention to individuals. Individuals, and they are very, you know, they feel very, this world is uh, passive, it's uh, solitary, it's uh, people, people and people, it, it, um, among people, person and just like uh, atomic, they are, you know, alone and uh, strong the uh, arcades and far from the social structures. And they want to, you know, they want to get involved in social structures. They want to be, uh, to be very important person in, in, in the main, you know, social structures, but they can't. But I think this word has a new meaning in in China and particularly on the internet. I think this word I, I use my my mean, I use I think they is I want to emphasize on um, they are you know active interactive and also the image of the community communities and uh, that's that's uh, what I think. And how to, you know, if you want to, to, to observe uh, Chinese social change, I think we can, uh, we can, we can observe from five, dim uh, five dimension, dimensions. And the first, we should pay attention to individuals' uh, attitude and behavior. And uh, I, in, the, in this uh, meaning, I think I just want to individuals, not just individuals. Not just uh, persons. I think they are flat, uh, flat, flat, uh, uh, flat, uh, I'm sorry. And uh, I just want to emphasize they are enabled. They can, you know, they can have their uh, shelf uh, 
determination. And they, they are active. They're not just uh, passive. And that's, that's what I think. And also, the, the, two, the third, I think, the, the, the second uh, dimension, and we should pay attention to it, the global communication. If the people, just a person, just a person, and it's not uh, no meaning. And so people in the society want to be uh, meaningful something, and maybe they should get together. And so global communication, uh, particularly dialogue and the debate, uh, can, uh, can, can, can happen on the internet. And so I, I just want to emphasize uh, uh, internet and also like you know it's like a space is this space and also the time and uh, uh, it's a very special meaning for me I think uh, time is time space is time space is space but uh, in Chinese new media space I think the time just uh, extends to uh, Chinese uh, civilization C C C V civilization. Uh, is, 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 is just a lot of the meaning and a lot of things. Uh, and also, I, I just want to emphasize on social capital, and particularly in China, and the Chinese people, sometimes Chinese people, they don't, uh, they don't uh, you know, identify uh, private space and the public space. And uh, that's, I think, is a, is a lot of, uh, that's a bad aspect. But also, I, I want to say, also, this exists some, some good aspect. Uh, because uh, social capital is, a, is I think, is a, is a, can, 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 can realize, can, <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's, it's a very important uh, word, can, can work in, can, it, it's possible for people, uh, for indi uh, individuals to, you know, contribute to, to establish the, their community on the internet, and they can help each other, and they can change something. That's what I want to say. And also, I think uh, the, the third level, and I think the social change, we should pay attention to organize organizations, and then we emphasize on social self-organizations, particularly NGOs, it's independent NGOs. And also we should uh, have a uh, clear uh, boundary um, from you know, the state and the, the, the society. And also I think very important uh, in Chinese uh, new media and can change our <coughs> Uh, our law and the regulation and the law and the regulations is a, is a, is a very important level for Chinese uh, social change and also the, the, all the things that get together I think it means uh, social change but they, they, they belong to different levels uh, and the question another question I think the changes of the individuals identities um, and the first we call the netizen. Netizen means Wang Yu, Wang Ming. And for, for our co communication, we just uh, emphasize the one way communication. But more and more we call the Wang, uh, net friends, Wang Yu. And this means uh, citizens, uh, netizens, just not just get information from the internet, and also they can talk, they can uh, dialogue, and also they can debate. Uh, particularly, a lot of uh, public affair, uh, affairs they, they pay attention to to this field, and so it's uh, different. Uh, and also, I I pay attention to the net criminals. Uh, more and more, you know, e e e company uh, just the e e business business on the internet and the people, you know. They can live. They can live. They can just we call the Chinese China, and they can just stay at home. Everything can get from the internet, and that's a very important thing, a symbol. And because a lot of people they don't they they can they can they can read a lot. They can know a lot of things without any traditional Chinese media. 
and you know, uh, as the, in the past, the Chinese new, uh, traditional media very play a very important role for people to get in, to get in information. To, to, that's very important the resources. But now people can ignore, <laughs> and they also can get a lot of information. And so that's the difference, and it's also uh, it's also more and more deal with our everyday life. And so it's also uh, offer opportunity and the space for people can uh, can far away from the main uh, social stru structures. And so I, I just want to, yeah, how do you see the uh, social and uh, uh, the social change? And I, I also use some you know perspective, perspectives to to observe. And the first I think maybe public space and also the media public space and uh, uh, media events, a uh, lot of things happen. And uh, this area, I think Professor Yang Guobing and I <laughs> pay attention to this field a lot. And uh, more and more, and uh, we, we think, and also the new social movement is also a uh, very important uh, uh, perspective for us to observe Chinese social change. And also e-commerce and uh, e-government and also e-philosophy. Um, how do you <laughs> say that? And also, a lot of people think, uh, think uh, pe uh, officer, uh, senior officer, they don't use the internet. Actually, it's wrong. A lot of uh, Chinese uh, senior officers, they, they, they pay attention to the new media, and also they get a lot of information from the uh, new media. Differ a little bit. I think NGO in China should push for public participation and accountabilities. And it is scientists' job to actually come up with evidence. Not standing with NGOs or not standing with governmental business, they should be standing independently saying what their research has told them. But oftentimes they don't do that. So NGOs are forced to take positions based on little evidence or little information that are available to them. Oftentimes when we ask information disclosures from government, it is really difficult and they can reject us by saying this is procedure information, therefore they are, they are not allowed to release it, release them. So in summary, I think environment and uh, Urbanization is a huge issue in China. China is no longer rural society, but rural urban uh, is, a big, is, is a related issue and it becomes increasingly connected. And uh, my sort of take-home message is this. I have worked in the environmental field for more than 10 years and I learned that there is no technical solution, technical quick fix to environment problems. Without transparency, without accountabilities, technical solution yield no solution. Technical you know, innovations yield no solutions to environment problems. We really need to have widened accountability and transparency so that the public can really get informed and become active monitor of the situation. Thank you. Thank you, Li Bo. Um, our next speaker, Professor Wong Uh, 
but I also very, uh, you know, uh, thanks for Professor Yang Guobin. Uh, he gave me quite a space. Let me uh, choice what topic I, <laughs> I believe this t uh, today. And uh, actually, I think a lot about, you know, as Yang Guobin uh, introduced, uh, my, my research area is about, is on new media and social change and new media and civil society. But a lot of, uh, you know, questions and also a lot of uh, yeah, questions I should uh, think about. And the more and the more I think, uh, actually, you know, I, I am a Weibo <laughs> So I observed Weibo for the two, almost the two years. And so I think a lot uh, uh, about the Weibo and the relationship between <coughs> Weibo and the Chinese uh, social change. And so I, I gave this uh, this topic this this title. I think it's quite uh, quite uh, quite imagination. <laughs> and uh, actually, in China, I think uh, new media, particularly, I think uh, provide information, and also new media lets people uh, can express what they want, and also uh, provide people can take action. And that's the three key uh, words I, I focused on. Just the inform people get information, and the people can express, people can uh, take action, use the internet, and use the new media, what really happened in China. That's my uh, first, I think, about uh, these three uh, key words. And then I conclude them, I think maybe it's a very important uh, uh, term new media empowerment in China. And also I find what's the new media empowerment, what's the, the subject, what's the really important element, what is, and I found the words, <laughs> planner. Uh, so I just want to begin my uh, lecture. And uh, as you know, uh, social media, actually internet, uh, begin, uh, uh, began in uh, internet, uh, more and more people use internet, I think, is, uh, for almost uh, 20 years. Uh, <coughs> but uh, social media played a very important role in China, and uh, we must uh, mention the, uh, Weibo in China. And the Weibo, as you know, is just like uh, uh, Twitter, but it's a different. Twitter and uh, I think the social media and in, in best countries, and maybe they also made a lot of serious programs, uh, for example, uh, privacy, privacy issues. But in China, and I think uh, social media, we pay attention to our social changes, and our social changes, and also pay attention to a lot of uh, political issues. And so you can see more and more, you know, China, uh, China gov Chinese government uh, uh, censorship seriously and also uh, control, you know, the new media. But uh, actually, uh, more and more, new media grow, uh, grows up, grows uh, rapidly. And so what's really happened? And so I, first I think we should ask some, some main questions. And uh, what does uh, new media really mean in China? And also, what roles has been new media playing during the period on Chinese social change? And how many new media have been affecting social change in, in China? And also, I think, the, what relationship are there among the individual and the existing social structures, social relations? Mm -hmm. And so I try to under, uh, answer these questions, and I find the, uh, this image of uh, Flanner. And as you know, from this uh, concept from uh, Walter uh, Benjamin, and uh, in his book, I think he uh, pay attention to individuals. Individuals, and they are very, you, you know, they feel very. This word is a uh, passive, is a uh, solitary, is a uh, people, people and people, it, it, um, among people, a person, and just like a uh, atomic. They are, you know, along and uh, strong the uh, arcades and far around the social structures. 
and they want to, do, you know, they want to get involved in social structures. They want to be, a, to be a very important person in, in, in the main, you know, social structures. But they can't. But I think this word has a new meaning in in China and particularly on the internet. I think this word I I use my my mean I, I use I think they is I want to emphasize um, they are you know active interactive and also the image of the community communities and uh, that's that's uh, what I think and how to you know if you want to 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 observe uh, Chinese social change I think we can. Uh, we can we can observe from five dim uh, five dimension dimensions, and the first we should pay attention to individuals' uh, attitude and behavior. And uh, I in the, in this uh, meaning, I think I just want to individuals, not just individuals, not just uh, persons. I think they are flat 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 flat. I'm sorry. And uh, I just want to in emphasize they are enabled. They can, you know, they can have their uh, self uh, determination, and they they are active. They are not just uh, passive. And that's that's what I think. And also the the two the third I think the the, the second uh, dimension, and we should pay attention to is the global communication. If the people just a person, just a person. And it's not uh, no meaning, and so people in the society want to be uh, meaningful something, and maybe they should get together. And so global communication, uh, particularly dialogue and the debate, uh, can uh, can 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 happen on the internet. And so I I just want to emphasize. Uh, internet and also like you know it's like a space is this space and also the time and the, uh, it's a very special meaning for me I think uh, time is time space is time space is space but uh, in Chinese new media space I think the time just uh, extends to uh, Chinese uh, civilization C C -C civilization uh, <laughs> it's, 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 it's a lot of the meaning and a lot of the things. Uh, and also, I, I just want to emphasize on social capital, and particularly in China and the Chinese people. Sometimes Chinese people they don't uh, they don't uh, you know identify uh, private space and the public space. And uh, that's, I think, is a, is a lot of uh, that's a bad aspect. But also, I I want to say, also this exists some some good aspect uh, because uh, social capital is a, uh, I think is a, is a, can 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 realize can. <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's, it's a very important uh, words can can work in. Can, it, it's possible for people, uh, for indi uh, individuals, to you know contribute to establish their community on the internet, and they can help each other, and they can change something. That's what I want to say. And also, I think uh, the the third level, and I think the social change, we should pay attention to organize organizations and then we emphasize on social self organizations particularly NGOs it's independent NGOs and also we should uh, have a uh, clear uh, boundary um, from you know the state and the, the, the society and also I think very important uh, in Chinese uh, new media and can change our <coughs> Uh, our law and the regulation and the law and the regulations is a, is a very important level for Chinese uh, social change and also the, the, all the things that get together I think it means uh, social change but they, if they, they belong to different levels uh, and uh, the question another question I think the changes of individuals identities um, 
And the first uh, we call the netizen. Netizen means Wang Yu, Wang Ming. And uh, for, for our co communication, we just uh, emphasize the uh, one way communication. But more and more we call the Wang, uh, net friends, Wang Yu. And this means uh, citizens, uh, netizens, just not just get information from the internet, and also they can talk, they can uh, dialogue, and also they can debate. Uh, particularly, a lot of the public affair, uh, affairs they, they pay attention to to this field, and so it's a different. Uh, and also, I I pay attention to the net criminals. Uh, more and more, you know, uh, e e uh, e e company, uh, just the e, e business business on the internet and the people, you know. They can live, they can live, they can just, we call the Chai Nu, Chai Nan, and they can just stay at home. Everything can get from the internet. And that's a very important thing, a symbol. And because a lot of people, they don't, they can't, they can, they can read a lot, they can know a lot of things without any traditional Chinese media. And you know, uh, at the in the past, the Chinese new uh, traditional media very play very important role for people to get in, to get in information. To, to that's very important resources. But now people can ignore, <laughs> and they also can get a lot of information. And so that's the difference. And it's also uh, it's also more and more there with our everyday life. And so it's also. Uh, offer opportunity and the space for people can uh, can far away from the main uh, social stru structures. And so I, I just want to, yeah, how do you see the uh, social and the, uh, the social change? And I, I also use some you know perspective, perspectives to to observe. And the first I think maybe the public space and also the media public space. And uh, uh, media events, a uh, lot of things happen. And uh, this area, I think Professor Yang Guobing and I <laughs> pay attention to this field a lot. And uh, more and more, and uh, we, we think, and also the new social movement is also a uh, very important uh, uh, perspective for us to observe Chinese social change. And also e commerce and uh, e government and also e-philosophy. And how to <laughs> say that? And also, a lot of people think, uh, think uh, pe uh, officer, uh, senior officer, they don't use the internet. Actually, it's wrong. A lot of Chinese uh, senior officers, they, they, they pay attention to the new media, and also they get a lot of information from the uh, new media. Rich, he go to the <coughs> knowledge, he go back how the village people. So we also try, we also want to try to tell the poor students, your hometown needed keep the nature. So we also have another activities we call river watch in your hometown. Now is every Saturday in Beijing, in Guangzhou, in Yunnan, in many capital city, we have the activities. The scientists take it, the normal people around walk around the hometown river. We call this a little shui xing. I try to ask the local people under yourself hometowns river. It's a five years. Every Saturday, the people join us. So we, it's a one university student. She help us together try to, it's a, we research Beijing river quality. One year, we research 40 rivers. We find it, it's a, 40 rivers, most of them is very, very, very dirty. 
water. So last week, we wrote articles for the newspaper. This newspaper said, it's a Beijing waters couldn't drink. It's so terrible. So after this uh, article's published, it's uh, even not only Beijing governor afraid about it, even central government is also ask this journalist, this is true? So I think it may be just a walk around the river is very, very small activities. But if you keep to do it, you can fight change. So now it's uh, every time we, we try to explain this situation, go with us together, understand about the nature. Because uh, this is uh, in the Tibet mountain. Two thousand, in 1998, I've been there, it's green. But now, it's like this. This is earth, yellow in China. Green is other countries. So how can keep the nature we need it work together? Thank you. Thank you. Um, we are running late, but I think we can take a couple of questions. So. Um, I guess two questions. Um, Stephanie? Uh, um, two questions for um, Shannon. Um, two questions for Professor Shu. Um, when you were talking about the um, use of uh, new media by government officials, you said that government officials have started taking new media seriously, and um, also that they were using new media um, or just internet communication in general to um, increase transparency of the state of state practices. I'm very interested in this um, because I know that in the United States there are currently a lot of um, new initiatives and initiatives underway to start using new media, um, to start monitoring new media, to basically surveil the populace um, by like, you know, the CIA and FBI and uh, agencies like that. Um, and also, um, in a recent article, in a, in a sort of small uh, independent publication called New Inquiry, there was just a, an article about how perhaps uh, transparency of the state has actually worked more for the state than, I, than for people um, in the United States because it just makes everyone transparent and since the government can protect itself more, that just means that people are more exposed rather than everyone straying equally. Um, so, given that whole comparative framework, my, my two really short bunch of questions are just in what ways are officials using new media in China, um, and how and to what extent has um, transparency happened on the internet by officials? It's very hard to you know, use um, two sentences of two or uh, three minutes to answer this question. But I think the uh, most important thing is uh, just uh, new media form the uh, public opinion uh, and the push or force the government to change uh, their attitude and behavior. And I think the attitude is very important. And because sometimes you can't say that, it's invisible but they change. And so that's also the, uh, very, you know, it's very difficult for foreigners to research Chinese 
questions, and just because they change, you you, you can't see, you can't you can't use the the policies or something like that. So you they they, they they change it by themselves, and also uh, I think uh, this change is 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 in the process. Is you is a need some time, but uh, uh, you know on the me on new media a lot of big affairs and also the media events uh, happened. A lot of Chinese senior officers they learn from the from the, the the media events, and they when they met the same questions, the same issues, and they can you know can uh, take actions and uh, more and more. Uh, not just that they like to take some medicine, they change their, their ideolo ide ideology and also they change the, the methods and also they, you know, it's more and more uh, people like, the, like it and just because of uh, public opinion, they learn from that and that's the, also the time, you know, the different time, different events, but uh, um, step by step, a little bit and a little and little by little change, and we should pay attention to this. <laughs> One that's the last question. Thanks. Uh, I actually just got a really short question. I don't have a long back one, so I would like to ask. Uh, Ms. Wang and uh, Ms. Lee, uh, Mr. Lee, since you both of you are, uh, you know, experts in the field of, you know, environmental protection, I'm just wondering that, um, you know, if you could really achieve the changes, uh, the changes you were mentioning, you know, in the uh, environmental protection field, without, let's say, literally overthrowing the government. I mean, yeah, it's true. Thanks. Um, <laughs> I think uh, whether to overthrow it or not, it's not up to, um, it's not really up to, um, a particular environment progress. Nationally speaking, uh, environment challenges have been just overwhelming. Um, the the uh, urbanization, the implication of urbanization uh, is just mind boggling in terms of underground water pollution, availability of uh, availability of resources that are meeting the healthy, minimum healthy standards. Um, you know, I agree with Jennifer about so many pollutions have been pushed to the hinterlands or the western regions, but at the same time, what we forget is most of those pollutions, they are trickling down through the rivers. Uh, they are not just saying up there. So we are talking about um, penetrating pollutions, penetrating through food system, through water systems, um, and uh, through air. So there is a huge legitimacy question of the government to act and to act efficiently, to answer to the basic needs of people. And I see there is a, a, a huge tension there. Um, and I sometimes doubt myself that um, to an extent NGO can act to meet the means to solve this environmental problems. I think I'm pretty pessimistic most of the time, but it doesn't mean we shouldn't act. We act according to uh, resources available to us, capacity we have, but I think sooner or later more people far beyond NGOs, limited capacity, well act, for instance, waste uh, is, a, is an issue like that. Um, uh, the city of Guangzhou um, is acting 
And I think, um, to my understanding, the Chinese urban citizens are going to be the forerunner of the environmental problems by the time they, the environment is unbearable. Um, five years, ten years, I think more people will stand up asking for healthy environment and healthy environmental services or products. I just want to give you some example. It's the one in 1996 <coughs> when we have the green nurse volunteers. That moment, the Beijing only three environment NGO. The China also very few, but now several thousand NGOs, environment NGOs. And uh, I learned from the Eco Tour that the volunteers from the United States in the zoo. So I know about this, the zoo have the volunteers in 1996. But uh, when I come back, I try to influence the Beijing Zoo. Until 2004, I used the eight years. Now Beijing Zoo have the volunteers. And the volunteers are very useful, the leaders, the zoo leaders. 2003, when I first time know about the new river, the government want to set up a 13 dams. 2004, we are first time interviewed there. It's a such beautiful area. Not only biodiversity, also cultural minor minorities. But we are very sad. We thinking we are so weak. We couldn't change. Because this government want to do it. Because we needed the energy. But we keep thinking. Try, stand by stand, and to today, just now I say already eight years, no deaths in New River. So maybe we couldn't change policy, but I like use the words influence, influence policy. By thinking NGOs, maybe we couldn't do some things like the government do something. But we can one by one, I think one by one, this is very useful. This is my answer. Thank you. I think that's a very appropriate note to end our panel on. I'd like to thank our speakers for uh, wonderful afternoon presentations, and I would like to thank everybody for attending this event. Um, I think our session is over. Um, good evening. And